There is a lot of excitement surrounding today's show. Jack Prasabic joins us. His new book is Unhumans, The Secret History of Communist Revolutions and How to Crush Them. He is joined by his co-author, Joshua Lysak. He is a best-selling ghostwriter. He has written more than 80 books. Uh, he's also a hypnotist. I have a million questions for him. And of course, uh, J- Jack is the editor of Human Events, host of Human Events Daily. Uh, he is a veteran. He has lived in China. He speaks fluent uh, Chinese. He has been an intelligence director for Navy Expeditionary Forces Command Pacific Task Force. And uh, he is the author of multiple best-selling books. He lives in Washington, D.C. presently with his wife and their two sons. You can follow him on X, Jack Posobiec, P-O-S-O-B-I-E-K, and uh, read more at humanevents.com. Sorry, somebody say something there? Uh, it's uh, with and, a C, not a K. Uh, what did I say? <laughs> with did I say K, K at the Pos- end? Yeah. <laughs> yeah P-O-S-O-B-I-E-C, correct. Uh, interesting. That was a mindless slip on my part. We'll get right to it after this. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Let's talk about aging because everyone wants to know how to slow it down. For almost a decade, I've been taking a healthy aging supplement called True Niagen. This supplement boosts NAD. That's something that cells can't live without. It's done with a patented form of nicotinamide riboside called NR or Niagen. It's more efficient and more scientifically reviewed than NMN or other NAD boosters. True Niagen is truly the best way to boost NAD levels. And it's made by Chromadex. They're the gold standard in the NAD space. Dr. Charles Brenner, the scientist who discovered the NAD boosting potential of NR, explains. And the center of the metabolism that allows the conversion of food into energy is NAD coenzymes. And NAD gets disturbed um, in the aging process. And as we're exposed to conditions of metabolic stress, Mm. niagen, which is the... um, form of of nr that was developed by chromadex is the is the best and the only fully legal form of nr and this is really the gold standard for nad boosting uh vitamins i love this product i urge you to try it go to drdrew.com slash true niagen for 20 percent off your order that is drdrew.com slash true niagen t-r-u-n-i-a-g-e-n and enter dr drew at checkout drdrew and are ready to check out for 20% off. And I think you all know that I take this, this uh, supplement and have been on it for many, many years. And uh, whenever people say I look younger than my uh, chronological age, I always think it's got to be that true niagen. I take about 1,000 milligrams a day. Uh, this week is going to be quite a trifecta. In addition to Jack Posobiec today uh, and his co-author Joshua Lysak, we have uh, Matthias Desmet coming in tomorrow. Uh, which is, uh, again, he has been studying mass formation for a long time, so it's a perfect follow-on to our conversation today. And to put a final nail in the coffin of the week, we're going to speak to Mike Benz, obviously the uh, the social media influencer, let's call him, who has been raising awareness about the intelligence blob. Uh, and then Salty Cracker, Naomi Wolf, Tom Renz, Donald Trump Jr., and Mike Lindell is on the schedule. So we'll get all those in here coming up, so be sure to stay with us. Today we are welcoming, as I said, Jack Posobiec. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter, uh, Jack Posobiec, P-O-S-O, let me get this right, P-O-S-O-B-I-E-C. Also, Human Events uh, is where you can follow him on X as well. Joshua is Joshua, Un- no, Joshua Lysek, L-I-S-E-C. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Real pleasure to be here. So there I guess go, guys. Jack unmuted. Uh, I think we're all in. Here we are. Jack, you there? Oh, had it on mute. There we go. So I got something to say. Beautiful. It's a real pleasure and an absolute honor to be here. 
Well, nowhere for us to go but down. So, so hopefully, hopefully that feeling will be carried through the rest of the show. Uh, so, uh, I I want Jack to talk about something straight off the top. Uh, one of one of your chapters. So, so the book is. Let me get the book so people can get it. Uh, Unhumans: The Secret History of Communist Revolutions and How to Crush Them. Uh, I am obviously fascinated by this. I I have been. I've become preoccupied in the last six months with the French Revolution. So I've gone down a hundred rabbit holes with the, that particular revolution. And I know you guys write about that in the book. It's one of the chapters, a couple of chapters, I think, are dedicated to the French Revolution. And one of the things that, um, amongst the many things that jump out at me about that period of history, was that uh, a lot of people don't realize that was where some of the ideas about, about totalitarian, totalitarianism really got going. The, the Jacobins wanted a centralized administrative state, essentially Louis the Fourteenth state, just run by the citizens rather than run by a monarch. And that all that thinking, the you know, sort of started bleeding into this idea that there should be equity of uh, essentially property. That's where the the Saint Coulette eventually went. Um, but tell me about what you were thinking in terms of uh, Jack writing about uh, the French Revolution. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you, you've basically got all the high points there. So essentially what we see is exactly that. And, and one really important thing for people to understand, and I think they will, uh, if they're listening to this, they go out and if they're interested in learning more and purchasing on humans and reading about this, is that we're still living through the French Revolution. We're still living through it right now. These ideas, uh, even the rise of communism that we saw in Russia, it was predicated by these ideas that come out of the French Revolution. And Karl, uh, Karl Marx himself and Engels, of course, refer back to this many times in their own writing, that, uh, that these ideas did not originate with them, but in fact, it originated in the French Revolution. And so even basic phrases that people use every day, like the words left and right, I don't even think people realize that that goes right back to the French Revolution. The Jacobins sat on the left and the monarchists and the royalists sat on the right. And as, to your point, they were attempting to not just uh, def redefine society, but they were taking a system of power that was already in place that existed in the kingdom of France at the time, and they were attempting to subvert it in the sense of it would be now controlled by the bottom up. So the people who were at the bottom uh, in their terms of the society, the people who had been oppressed would then become the new oppressors. They would take the place of the oppressors. And in their view, this, this mindset, this Marxoid lens, which we now call it uh, today, we refer to the French Revolution in the book as a proto-communist revolution, for lack of a better term. But the idea, of course, isn't that they were going to create some sort of system of equality. The idea was, as you say, they were attempting to simply put themselves in charge of the new system. Now, when it comes to land, and it comes specifically to those ideas of land reform or uh, land reapportionment, this has always been part and parcel of communism and proto-communism going back to the French Revolution. And it is still, it's with us today. It's what we see going on in New York City on a regular basis. Uh, you can go and open the news and you'll see somebody going and getting arrested from trying to kick some squatters out of their own house. This is uh, the abolishment of private property, reapportionment of land, reapportionment of wealth. Uh, and we saw this, of course, we saw the homeless moving into the Palace of Versailles. We saw homeless people moving into the palace, which is now the Louvre, of course, the most beautiful museum on the face of the planet. Uh, and again, this was all completely turned upside down by the French Revolution in the name of equality, in the name of equity, in the name of inclusion, many of the same buzzwords that we all hear today. And what's very interesting, and people need to understand this, is that initially it was done as a reform movement. The Jacobins weren't in power right at first. The Jacobins came along later. You'll see this as well with Russia. You'll see this in China. The Jacobins come along later, but initially it was just about reform. It was about making society better. It was about helping people. But then at somewhere along the line, these, these politics of grievance, these politics of envy, these politics of resentment actually come to the fore. And because those were seen as the more fervent adherents, the more devoted adherents of the revolution and of the new way of things, of course, uh, this, this goes back to the Romanticist movement, and which, which the revolution, of course, bore a lot out of. Uh, as we know, of course, the French, uh, the French are known for their love. 
And and so if you didn't love the revolution, then of course you may perhaps you weren't willing to go quite as far as others. So what I say, what I mean to say by all that is that the people who were willing to go the furthest were the ones that eventually won the revolution. Those were the Jacobins. And for them, simply reforming society or raising taxes, which actually is what the whole thing started over in the first place, wasn't enough. They had to go and start actually executing the leaders of society all the way up to and including, as we know, the king and the queen. Yeah. And what, uh, if you're a student of history at all, what everyone needs to realize is that when these sorts of purges develop, which they inevitably do, because you have to force people to participate in these things because it's, it runs contrary to so many human impulses, they're forced into it and you're never pure enough. So whoever puts the people on the guillotine ends up on the guillotine, including, if I remember right, Dr. Guillotine himself. Uh, you all have, yes. Robespierre certainly ended up on there. Everybody ends up on the guillotine until usually uh, a strong man comes in and says enough, uh, Napoleon in this case, and puts a stop to it. Uh, under the name of republicanism, he becomes uh, an emperor, which is comical, but uh, there we go. Uh, that, that's how these things run. They don't run sensibly. Um, uh, Josh, you know, these things always have... I, I don't know how to ask this. It, it, essentially, so much of the French Revolution, we're going to stay with that, was based on the principles of Rousseau. And there was never a bigger schmuck than Rousseau. There was never a bigger asshole than him. He, he himself uh, hauled around a, a young lady, uh, impregnated her five times, forced her to leave all five children on the doorstep of, a, of an orphanage at the time when the survival rate was about 10% in those orphanages. Uh, he was a horrible, horrible human advocating for the great, uh, the great uh, uh, what, what he called the noble, noble savage, the noble native, these, all these ideas about how humans really were, yet he himself was just a scumbag. Um, Psychology always enters into these um, revolutions, I guess let's call them. Why is that always the case? Why can't they be uh, more persuasion-oriented? Why can't they uh, sort of stay with the basics of how really human made of motivation and how humans work? Why, why do they always have denial about those things? Yes. So typically the communist revolution, be it a proto-revolution like in France or earlier in possibly the, the 20th, the well known 20th century communist revolutions, they all follow a set of patterns. And there's this sort of a template for the revolution that we talk about inside of the book. And one of the things that they do prior always prior to the revolution, is the messaging stage. There's a military term for this. It's called the Operational Preparation of the Environment, or OPE. And subversives, radicals, revolutionaries, prior to inciting the actual revolution itself, they do a little OPE work. And one of the aspects of OPE is, is messaging. How can they manipulate the masses, particularly the malcontents, the fringes of society, what has sometimes been referred to as a coalition of the fringes, those people who are the rejects either through the consequences of decisions outside their control or of their own decisions, thieving, robbing, and so on. And these revolutionaries will wrap those people up to be their evangelists, their advocates, their agitators in some cases. And then the movement will grow. And anyone who has a resentment who has envy, who has grievance. And this is key. This is key for the apparent legitimacy of the revolution. Legitimate grievances. This was certainly the case in pre-revolutionary France, as it was in pre-revolutionary Russia and in other places. Now we are seeing something like a communist revolution in the United States currently, which is something that we suggest in the book is a, is a, un a unique and useful filter through which to understand the current events, the times and seasons in which we uh, live. But this mass messaging is essential to get as many people as possible roped into the revolution prior. I'll give you a quick example of this. Prior to the worst parts, the most violent parts of the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin had a very simple slogan that appealed to all who were not aristocrats. And that slogan was, peace land bread. That is, get us out of this foreign war, that is World War I, reform the land so that the serfs 
can have proper ownership of the own, their own fields that they're toiling in, and then have plenty of food for everybody. Now, who would oppose peace, land, and bread but the bad guys? We're obviously the good guys because we want to give you the best you can. And this sort of, well, we saw in the French Revolution as well with the, the, the famous uh, slogan of, uh, I think in English it's uh, liberty, uh, equality, fraternity. Who would oppose those but a terrible person? And that standard messaging is easy to manipulate masses. And particularly, it's easy to lull the counter-revolutionaries into passivity because you don't want to be the bad guy. And we notice this in Ru Russian Revolution period where the Tsar's family held back. They did not attempt to put down the uprising, the Bolshevik rebellion. This also happened, of course, in the French Revolution. The royal family, Louis XVI, held back didn't want to appear that he was antagonistic. Okay, let's hear their demands. Let's see how reasonable they're going to be. Okay, well, let's just kind of kind of work with these people, let it go. Whereas in other times and seasons, such as in the, the Franco period of the Spanish Civil War, a resolute will of resistance, no, not on my watch, I will not let this happen, a very different outcome occurred. And that was the crushing of the communist revolution. And the, like I said, oftentimes these things end when a strong man comes in, so to speak, and a man in, in quotations. Um, Jack, I, you know, the e e evil, social evil is always done in the name of good. Always. It just seems like that's a trend. Uh, and same with this, uh, you, you know, your book is called Unhuman. And yet this does seem to be a particular human phenomenon that is developing in periodic uh, sort of waves in, in the world. You both mentioned envy, uh, and envy is something that appears in humans with narcissistic traits. That's when envy is, it, it's one of the big liabilities of narcissism. So one of the questions, Jack, I've always had, I'm going to ask uh, Matthias Desmond the same question tomorrow, which is, are, are these things some sort of almost mathematical phenomenon that develop in evolution of governments or are there being consistently brought on from outside forces the way Lenin and his people brought it on or are these periods of character traits that develop over time in human beings in certain uh, waves, uh, with, with narcissism being the key one that is so prominent today and so prone to envy and so prone to projection and so prone to hysteria and all the things we've seen li lately in this country. Uh, is it, is it some, or is it some combination of these things? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I would say this and, you know, as, as a guy who's a, um, as a Christian, you know, this is something we would believe in. We would say we're all born with original sin. Man is, man is fallen. Man has a fallen nature. Uh, I, I'm a Hobbesian. What can I say in terms of that, that, um, that people, greed exists. Greed will always exist. And the way that this was dealt with politically in, in early societies, of course, is you would have the strongest member of the tribe becomes the leader of the tribe. And then that tribe goes beats up all the other tribes and then maybe you establish a king and the king becomes the ruler and the ruler just basically decides through power. We've all heard the story a million times. They use their power to decide what is fair and what is right. Um, but then they're able to still maintain that through a set of rules and through, through some sort of code. Uh, and we can see these going back thousands and thousands of years, things that even predate the Bible. And so what's, what's, this has been part and parcel of human society for as long as we've known about humanity, but something that's, that's not, um, something that's actually goes against the trend. I would say something that bucks the trend is civilization itself and the ability to create civilization under those conditions. It's very rare and it's very, it's very hard. Um, it hasn't been done very much throughout society, throughout civilized life. We've had empires over the time, but empires come and empires go, as we all know. And so the idea that you can get it quite right, where you've got the right mix of allowing people to, to work and have innovation, but as well as the right level of government, uh, whether, whether the form of the government comports that form of civilization, of course, is a huge issue here. 
where you have this flourishing of science, a flourishing of arts, a flourishing of actual human progress, I don't mean like progressive progress, um, mm -hmm. then you can kind of get it right. And so when you look at the United States as an experiment on this longer chain, which we're talking about here, which really comes to, to show how the United States and our particular and really peculiar form of government with a constitution, with the ability to change the constitution, with certain rights delineated as, as things that government shouldn't uh, be able to abridge, even though, of course, we could also we can all see the government abridging those rights on, on a daily basis lately. But this is something, of course, we get into in the book quite a bit because we try to explain that which it is right now so that we're living through. And so essentially what, what it comes down to is that with the rise of uh, democratic republics and constitutional republics that we still live in now. So we got away with the kings. The French Revolution wins, basically. We do away with the kings. We do away with the monarchs, Russian Revolution. Uh, Spain, of course, maintained their monarch, but um, after after Franco um, uh, wins the war, but then even after Franco loses, it leaves power when he passed away, uh, Spain eventually decided to move to a more democratic republic. And so the French Revolution wins. We get rid of the kings. We aren't going to have kings anymore, but there's a problem because there's a short circuit in the system. And the short circuit comes as to what exactly we're talking about right now, that when you introduce envy coupled with a form of justification of that, look, we all feel envious. We all feel envious all the time. Uh, someone's got a better car than us. Someone's got a bigger house than us. Someone's got a better whatever. Um, we all feel that type of envy, but we all, we sit back and say, Maybe I should work harder. Maybe I should work, uh, you know, put in some more hours at work, or maybe I should get a better job. Maybe I should get a promotion. Maybe I should move. We, we think about how we can improve ourselves to achieve those things. But then maybe for a second, maybe for a split second, we might think, what if I took that, per that from that person? And what if I made it my own? And this is, of course, how you get theft. And so th theft always begins with envy. It begins with greed. It begins with this uh, licitous desire. And so the problem is if you couple envy with the justification of envy and inject that into a democratic process, which is what we're seeing now, you will eventually unravel that society completely because you will start telling people that the only reason that there are people who are successful, the only reason there are people who have achieved anything. And I'm not just talking about like the super rich or, you know, anybody who's gotten, you know, gotten rich through like, you know, shady schemes or anything like that. I mean, like small business owners. These are the people who were targeted by the Bolsheviks. Um, they called them the Kulaks back then. But you'd say small business owner, people who have, oh, I don't know, an Airbnb or a rental property. These are the people who always end up bearing the brunt of all of this. They're, they, of course, they go for the Christians, the religious leaders first. But after that, on the economic side, the people they go for are the people who are just just one rung above. Basically, it's not like the super, uh, the you know, the super rich, the super wealthy. They can always get out. It's actually those people who are just in like that upper middle class band that we see across these revolutions. Those are the ones who always end up suffering the most. And it's not done in the name of equality. And, and certainly, you know, you get the peasants lined up in the gulags and nothing's better for anybody else because you get lined up in these uh, Soviet block concrete housing and everything else. So nobody's actually doing any better other than the people who led the revolution in the first place. What you actually get, though, is more of the envy. You just get a justification for people tearing down uh, society, tearing down civilizations, tearing down histories, going after people who are successful, going after people who are, are better looking, people who are, are doing well, and saying, we are going to destroy you to essentially make you as miserable as we are. That's what you get through these things. In addition to Unhuman, I suggest people check out the, the White Pill, A Tale of Good and Evil, where Michael Malice uh, shows you exactly how Stalin and that regime was able to use the kulaks, which is different than the gulags, uh, to manipulate and uh, turn people on one another in the, in the name of uh, acting out this envy. Uh, Jack, I want to do you a, a favor, and I want to clarify, I want to distinguish between jealousy and envy. Uh, okay. Religions throughout history always have injunctions against envy because envy is different than jealousy. As you mentioned, jealousy is... Jack's got a nicer car for me. That makes me very uncomfortable. I don't like that feeling. I want that. I'm going to go work harder to be like him. Envy is not just, I want that. I'm going to steal that. But I got to knock him down. I have to destroy him. I have to, I have to take him down for making me feel less than. That's 
envy. Envy is one of the most destructive of human emotions. And it's the one that causes people to destroy other people for how they feel. And again, underneath that is narcissistic rage. I have a quick follow-on question for you, Jack, which is, as an intelligence officer working in, in sometimes in communist systems, did, did you see this coming here? Did, did this present moment, is it something you predicted? Did you see it underway? Is it, I mean, it's now that it's here and you're writing books on it, obviously it's like, you know, okay, here we are. Uh, to me, COVID sort of ripped the bandaid off for me on <laughs> some of the excesses. Did you see it coming or how did you, how did you come to understand this? Well, so um, I'll put it this way. When when I first worked in Shanghai, I was working for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, um, just out of college and, you know, super entry-level job at the Shanghai American Chamber of Commerce. And what was interesting, and we were helping U.S. companies and U.S. firms get into China. This was the idea that we're going to help. Um, we're going to help U.S. firms go into China. We're going to sell into the Chinese market. And of course, this is something that, of course, Western companies have been after since uh, since the 1800s, since the Opium War. Uh, of course, the British first tried to flood China with opium. The opium went over. Then they were trying to get goods into the uh, into the interior of China. This has been the dream. This has been the great dream of every every Western marketeer to be able to sell to 1.2 billion people. And the the thing that I learned while I was over there was that one of the reasons that the U.S. had built so many um, so many of these ties with China, and of course, it always kind of in the back of my mind saying, "Well, aren't these guys communists? There's a lot of hammer and sickle around here." And you know, my family's <laughs> Polish, and uh, we don't have a we don't have a great history when it comes to those guys. And um, this everyone said, "Oh, we're making money. We're making money. We'll all go along with it. Everything will be fine." Okay, all right, and. We were also told that during the opening up of China, which included the return of Hong Kong, uh, the handing over of Hong Kong by the British to China, which took place in the 90s, had been signed under Thatcher in the 80s, and then um, eventually the recognition of China into the WTO, their accession there, uh, given the most favored nation status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, very much the story. But we were always sold this bill of goods that said, well, the more open we become to China, the more they'll become like us. They'll become democratic. They'll become capitalist. And capitalism will always equal a free society. And that was the, that was the you know, boilerplate that we were all told. Well, when I was over there, though, I'll tell you what I would see is that we would bring over congressional delegations and business leaders and government leaders, and they would come to Shanghai. And they would be given these tours by the leaders of Shanghai at the time. Uh, Xi Jinping actually was one of the leaders of Shanghai back then. He was, the, he was the party chairman of the city of Shanghai long before he became the chairman of the entire party itself. And they would go down to the Shanghai Municipal Planning Museum. And it was sort of this, this idea where they would tell you what was coming next for Shanghai, what was coming next for southern China. And they would tell you, and it was always the mega projects. And everyone, everyone knows that China is, of course, uh, they, they love their mega projects ever since the, the Great Wall of China, the Great Canal of China, which doesn't exist anymore, but it used to be this giant river, sort of a man-made river, um, Three Gorges Dam, et cetera. And so they would talk about high-speed rail. They would talk about all of these wondrous things that they were putting together to innovate in China. And when when American politicians would say, well, what about the, uh, you know, what about the property rights of the people who live in the, along the line of this high-speed rail? Or what about uh, health concerns, environmental concerns? And CCP officials would kind of look at them and say, what about them? Who cares? <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not, not a concern of ours. And so you would see how American leaders, and not just Americans, but Western leaders would become intoxicated by mm -hmm. having that level of power, by seeing that level of power, getting a taste of it. And this is almost, that was 2006, 2007, so we're talking almost 20 years ago now, that um, though that's how the seeds were planted. And you can see, just pick up a copy of The Economist and you'll see um, you'll see them talking this way. It's, it's, it's the rise of a technocracy and the rise of being able to do whatever whatever it is we're capable of doing, rule by expert, mm. rule by the party, okay, the new party, whatever you call it, and then using whatever phrases make sense in a Western context to be able to achieve what they call, and, and now, you know, Jamie Dimon and some of these people have talked about it, the China model and replicating that throughout the West. And of course, when when COVID came down and all of these things started happening throughout the West, I said, "Wait a minute this this reminds me of the stuff they used to do back over there. Now they're just now they're just bringing it here under a different name, but it's the exact same systems, it's the exact same lies, and it gives them the exact same levels of power that the Chinese Communist Party have had since well 1949." Well, in fact, the when the Italian shutdown was perpetrated by a politician who wrote a book about it. 
that they had to take off the market because his book was about not his success in, in uh, shutting down COVID, but his admiration for the Chinese model and how he wanted to show how that would work in Italy. And uh, that's a book by Michael Singer where he chronicles that uh, called Snake Oil Science. And it, it's, it is shocking that that kind of thing has been happening. I have to take a little break. Before I do, though, I want to go to Josh and ask you about OPE. So is somebody doing that or is that just their snake oil siren? Xi Jinping shut down the world. Um, that's that yellow line is his the graph that the uh, leaders in, uh, uh, what's the name of the city that the virus broke out in? Help me, somebody. Um, Hunan. Yes, and uh, the virus, that's the graph they sent the, the leaders uh, sent to Xi Jinping about what the lockdown had, lockdown had accomplished, which of course is total BS. Um because uh, it, you know, as we well know, it came back and came back and came back. You can't use lockdown to eliminate a respiratory virus. But uh, OPE, Josh, is that is somebody doing that, or is that again it's just a trend? And these that there's a wind blowing where people are sort of getting involved with this, and they see this as a technique, there, or is it useful idiots? Uh, where is this coming from? Over the last quarter of a millennium, we see the same type of individuals show up. And of course, in the book, we refer to them as unhumans because it's both a noun and a verb. What they do when they take power, regardless of time, place, or race of the perpetrators, they unhuman their victims. And we are what we do. So they deprive them first of rights to their property, then of their rights to liberty, freedom of association, freedom of religion, and so on. And then they deprive them of the right to life. And all those human rights are seized by the subversives who are possessed by envy. And their worldview is the oppressed versus oppressor model that Jack was talking about, where there are the people who are good, they're the ones who are have-nots. They're the victims of the ones who are the haves of the society, that is, the oppressors. You have because you took. You've been taking for these however many years, and so it's time for you to have your stuff taken back. And there's a sense of entitlement in this. And dare I say, social justice is part of the communist principle. It's an application of the communist principle that we should all share this stuff. And it's those bad people who, who took, who cheated, who lied, who thieved. And whether that is legitimate grievance or not is usually besides the point. But it's the instigators of this who want the power for themselves, who are doing the manipulating, who are doing the operational preparation of the environment for revolution. First, what they do, the first stage of OPE for the revolution, is they separate, meaning they identify who in the society are the oppressors, who are the oppressed, who are the haves, who are the have-nots. At that point, they begin sort of caucusing with, coalescing with, or to use a favorite leftist term, organizing this coalition, this coalition of the fringes, those groups who believe themselves to have grievances with the society for socioeconomic reasons, racial reasons, culture, cultural reasons, and what have you. And so they organize that group. And then comes the messaging. That's where they, to be frank, hypnotize their side with the same repetitive messaging simple language, easy to understand, we're talking fifth grade level and below, like peace, land, bread, and other three-word expressions we might have heard in the last few years here in the Western world. And then they spread those people as messengers out specifically to influence the masses. Because, well, I don't want to oppose peace, land, bread. Like I was saying earlier, that would make me a bad person. That sounds like they're doing some good work there. Okay, liberty, equality, brotherhood. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good. And so it lulls people into a false sense of safety and security that this sort of uprising is, oh, actually, it's going to do some good work. It's going to right some historical wrongs. That's the second stage of operational preparation for the environment, followed by the third stage, which is infiltration. Infiltration. And this is where the subversives, either they themselves or they'll send out their minions, their, their vanguard, uh, to take possession of key institutions, choke points, organizations, you could say branches of government, 
where they need to hold control or at least have sway over the fate of that institution. Sometimes, as in Russia, they will do what's called the dual power strategy, where they will try to infiltrate the main organization while building up their own on the side just in case. They need to seize the existing power structure. We saw this with, with what were called Soviets. People think, wait, what, Soviets like the people? No, the Soviets. These were councils of workers and peasants who would self-organize all over Russia, and they'd become these sort of little micro-peasant governments. And that was part of the dual power strategy in case they needed to completely overthrow the existing power structure while simultaneously attempting to infiltrate and rule from within that structure. So infiltration always happens, and we see throughout each of these revolutions the same process, the same OPE tactics. And this is an argument we make in the book, that communism is not a coherent philosophy because there is so much internal contradiction. Because people with high ideals and philosophies abandon their own five children. It doesn't make any sense. There's hypocrisy everywhere. It's because it's not a philosophy. It's not a coherent worldview. It is weaponized, organized resentment. And the tactics they use are the tactics that are used by people who oppose civilization, who oppose law and order throughout history. It just so happens that over the last quarter millennia, they've used the same tactics and tools to tear down the human rights to life, liberty, and property wherever they've risen up. Josh Lysak, Jack Prasabic. The book is Unhumans, The Secret History of Communist Revolutions and How to Crush Them. Uh, obviously, there's several that is chronicled in the book. Uh, I've got uh, various uh, titles, uh, The Russian Revolution, The, uh, the uh, Untold Story of Civil Rights and Cultural Marxism in the United States. We've got, the uh, obviously, the French Revolution, the Spanish uh, Civil War, the Russian Revolution. A lot to read about there, and it repeats itself in terms of these techniques and these strategies and these historical trends that we need to all be aware of. Uh, how to crush them is what we will get into after this little break. What do we do about all this? How, it, it feels very sort of helpless, and it feels like it's, it's moving in such a way that— uh, it, it must be hard to, if, if, it, if it's actually happening, uh, hard to combat. But we will get into that with both you guys after this. You could spend thousands of dollars and dozens of hours trying to look a few years younger, or you can skip all that and the hassle and go with what works, Genucel Skin Care. Genucel is the secret to better skin. Their products are made in the USA using a proprietary technology that combines a naturally effective base with non-GMO ingredients. In fact, you might have witnessed the astonishing effects of Genucel during a recent unplanned moment of our show. When just a little Genucel XV restored my skin within minutes right before your eyes. That is how fast these products work. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. Retinols, vitamin C cream, under eye cream, night creams. Scrubs. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at Genucel.com. Susan and I love Genucel so much, we've created our own bundle so you can try our favorite anti-wrinkle creams, correcting serums, under eye treatments, Say goodbye to those fine lines, forehead wrinkles, skin redness, even those dark under eye bags. Women and men of all skin types, Genucel has got you covered. Order right now at Genucel.com slash Drew to save 50%, actually over 50%, and you'll get a free luxury spa box plus free shipping. That is Genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. We all know the value of a good night's sleep. We feel better, look better, have more energy to spare, but you could be missing out on all of those benefits if you're sleeping on sheets that are too hot or too cold or just plain uncomfortable. I have the solution. Cozy Earth Bedding. Cozy Earth is the softest and most comfortable sheets, blankets, loungewear, and more. They use premium viscose from highly sustainable bamboo, and we sleep in them regularly. I wear their t-shirts. Susan wears their pajamas. Cozy Earth Bedding comes with a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out. If you're not in love, just return them within 100 days for a full refund. Susan and I love them. In fact, we have Cozy Earth sheets on our bed right now, and they made a huge difference in our sleep. If you've never tried Cozy Earth, we have some awesome news. You can save up to 35% off Cozy Earth right now. But hurry, this offer will not last. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code DREW at checkout for up to 35% off on your first order. 
That is CozyEarth.com, promo code Drew, C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H, CozyEarth.com, code D-R-E-W. You asked for it, and the wellness company has delivered. The medical emergency kit, replete with ivermectin, prescription antibiotics, and more, continues to fly off the shelves. We keep one here at home. And there are three new kits you need to know about, and more are coming. The Contagion Emergency Kit was inspired by the high demand for the medical kits. In that Contagion Kit, you'll find ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, budesonide, and a nebulizer. And a must for your next trip is the Travel Emergency Kit, something I made sure exactly what I give my patients is in this kit and some more. The kit includes remedies for jet lag, a variety of infections, even GI ailments. Imagine your flight getting grounded anywhere, say even in the U.S., and you start getting sick. You do not want to be at the mercy of of the U.S. healthcare system or any healthcare system. At home, we keep the ultimate first aid kit on hand. It has over 20 essential supplies and medications for situations when time is of the essence. Order one for your car and your go bag. Because these kits contain prescriptions, your purchase includes a telemedicine consultation as well as an instruction manual. Go to drcom slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all your orders. I'm very excited about these kids. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate. Public health. Just quickly about the, the wellness company. You know, the, these kids are so valuable. We, we had a child that uh, my son got a infectious E. coli, a toxic E. coli, and we had to find ciprofloxacin that, that is in this kit. We have doxycycline in the emergency kits, which cover things like even STIs and tick-borne illnesses. And if you get a tick bite from a, from a, you know, a, a, a um, you know, you, from any, look out here, we've got murine typhus and obviously uh, people have Lyme disease in other parts of the country. And this taking it early and quickly is absolutely going to reduce the risk for that. And you don't want to be at the risk of the, the healthcare system and trying to get an appointment. I want to put the control back in the hands of the patients. And these kits do exactly that. Uh, also, I want to tell you about our friends at Paleo Valley. Uh, we've been talking about Unhuman, say the book, compares radical revolutions to the one we're going through today, radical revolutions of the past. Uh, they also offer ways to fight back solutions, which we're going to get into in just a minute. As I said, uh, TWC is one way, but here's one solution I'm also quite serious you should stock up on, which is the bone broth from Paleo Valley. Susan and I love this stuff. We have it every day. We were just traveling with it. Highest quality you'll find. It's tasting great. We like the chocolate. It comes in vanilla, unflavored as well. Add it to coffee every single day. Literally, it's not a day we go by without it. It's made from the actual bones of grass-fed and finished beef. You get the glycine, amino acid, glucosamine, gelatin, bioavailable protein, and collagen, which of course helps with skin, hair, nail, heals the gut. And you can, as a great source of protein, as I said, use our exclusive promo code, get it 15% off your first order of all the great products they offer, including the various sticks that are available now. 20% off when you subscribe to get a bigger discount on your bone broth, beef sticks, the new chicken sticks. They have the, um, the, uh, the Ben venison. We've started eating those last night, which was fantastic. Go to doctor.com slash paleo Valley for 15% off your first order, 20% when you subscribe. And tomorrow I will be joined by paleo Valley co-founder Autumn Smith. After I talk to Matthias Den Desmond, and you'll see Autumn has really put a lot into every one of her products and has thought everything through. She's a committed to health and we feel very fortunate to have these people uh, in our life supporting us. The wellness company, True Niagen, these guys at Paleo Valley, we're very, very lucky. Make Please. you healthy and happy, store it up just in case we uh, end up in a and communist you, state. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you worked with the, uh, <laughs> the superfood golden mix this morning. All they'll give you is rice, so you got to be careful. But Susan, you had the turmeric, turmeric. You had this product this morning. Uh, yeah. I mixed it with my bone broth. It's pretty yeah. tasty. It has turmeric and mushrooms and healthy, healthy stuff. All right, golden we're, milk. We're going to bring Jack Prosopic, How to Crush the Communist Revolution and... Uh, the uh, that is also with Josh Lysak, Unhuman, the secret history of communist revolution that had to crush them. There it is. Get it now. And let's get into the solution part of this, Jack. I'm going to start with you. It feels a little overwhelming to think about these things. The fact that these ideas have been flying around since the French Revolution, since 1790, makes it that much more sort of worrisome. Uh, I know we've been through various waves of it in this country. It seems to appeal 
I guess around the time, uh, 1930s, I guess, we had a big wave of it. We became convinced that Russia was the way to, uh, that had the answer to, and the, the idea of the Potemkin village was something that our journalists were led through, much the way the journalists were led through the Shanghai Museum that you were referring to there. What, what do we do to, to combat this? Well, you know, it's actually really interesting because there, there is something that's direct to what you're saying that we, we talk about a little bit in the book, but one of the things is that, that the United States actually did back in the 1930s, and people have to understand this, that something we learned going through each of these, even back to the fall of the Roman Republic and uh, the rise of the Roman Empire, is that all of these are always brought about predominantly because of economic disparities. That's what gives these things the juice to take your envious people, your envious class, whatever they call themselves in uh, whatever part of the world they're operating in, these unhumans, is, is the, that economic instability and the economic inequality takes them to a point where beyond uh, they're able to attain critical mass so that Mao is able to, to raise his army, that the unhumans are allowed to rile up the peasantry, rile up the people enough so that they're able to take power. What we're living in now is slightly different because uh, we're living through a cultural Marxist, what we call an irregular revolution, a regular communist revolution, because it's mostly taking place online. You can walk down the street, you're not going to be you know, accosted for... Um, you know, simply, uh, you know, having money or something like that. But, you know, you say one thing out of line or you make a phrase that's out of line or you post a, a meme or a cartoon that's considered too edgy and suddenly you're canceled. Uh, yes, the Chinese communists were the ones who came up with cancel culture in the first place. And so what you learn from all of these areas, what, what did the United States do if you go back even to even prior to the 1930s, that the United States started introducing things uh, as a response to the Industrial Revolution, like uh, just basic things, eight-hour work week, uh, eight-hour work day, 40-hour work week, introducing the weekend, these basic ways to start alleviating this pressure. So this is a huge part of it, is identifying things that actually are key uh, key grievances and then meeting them. That's number one. Number two, of, so that prevents the bond humans from being able to raise their, their massive amounts of forces. Number two is it's a word that goes back to uh, some of those old codes that we were talking about. And it's something that when I speak to the conservatives in my audience and particularly people out there who have been around for a long time complaining about what's happening but not really figuring out how to do anything about it, it's, it's an understanding that uh, simply debating and arguing and whining about it is not going to do anything. Uh, take today, for example. Um, you know, we got a guy who is the leading candidate for office. Donald Trump is currently on, on trial in New York City over this, this business regulation that they have trumped up into a felony. Now, look, if you're not a Trump supporter, then at least you could go out and say, let's let's have this out at the ballot box. Let's vote for this. Let's put it up and have a serious vote with, with actual election you know, integrity and to let people determine, based on our system of rules, whether or not we want to be the president. But that's not what's happening. In fact, this is being removed. It's the most undemocratic thing that we've, that we've seen. This isn't going to, and I use that as an example. You could find a million examples. It's just that it's going on right now, and it has to be said that this isn't going to stop until it is stopped. And that word that I was talking about, that old code that I was talking about, is the code of reciprocity. Lex Talonis. The idea that that which is done to me, to my side, will be done to your side. And when you have one group of people that's constantly launching investigations, not just to Trump, by the way, they're going after uh, they're going after Elon Musk, they're going after his companies, they're trying to find any way they can do to strip him of his power over X, to take him down, take out any free speech platform out there like Rumble or others, that these people will not stop. They will not stop until they receive a taste of their own medicine. And it's just as simple as that. Uh, that's the most basic thing that could be done in order to fight back right now in a very quick way. Going out and finding some serious, whether you're at the DA level, whether you're an attorney general, or even at the federal level, let's say, let's say Trump wins and you're able to put the shoe on the other foot, you've got to start 
responding with some fire with fire when it comes to this. And we're not talking about violence. I'm not talking about the riots in the streets like BLM and Antifa and those guys. I'm talking about actually ways to fight, to hurt these guys, hit them in the pocketbook where it really matters. Lawsuits, RICO, RICO conduct RICO organization, uh, RICO lawsuits of Antifa and BLM right there. Obvious example, and all the people who donated to them, the money laundering that was going on, the trafficking that was happening, it's so easy to do this, and yet you won't find people that seem willing to do so. On the, on the COVID front, where are the lawsuits on, uh, on these companies? And more, and more to the point, not just the companies, where are the lawsuits, the personal lawsuits against people who were going in on COVID? There are things that can be done on a direct level, and yet you don't, you, you know, you'll, 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 have, you'll go not? to government, where government are they? says- yeah, government will say, oh, let's, we're going to investigate, we're going to investigate, we're going to investigate, we're going to get emails. And, you know, you, you say, wow, we've got the facts now, we're done for. Okay, where's any kind of justice for the people that suffered under the tyranny of COVID? There's none. And I would say that the next time that those very same people get the opportunity, whether it's a COVID or we're hearing, what was the latest one I heard? A Daily Mail was running COVID-24 the other day. Bird flu always comes up every once in a while. Mm. Look, you're never going to stop these people because as, as Joshua says, it's not an ideology. It's a pathology. It is a, it is a tactic whereby in it, they're trying to gain power, to replicate the China model. And in doing so, the only way to actually stop them is to put roadblocks in their path and let them know that, no, this is the line and we'll, we will not be going any further. Where, where are the suits? Where, where, what do you think is preventing that from happening? Well, of course, there's um, there are. I had to catch myself there because of, certainly there are uh, immunity um, agreements in place for the companies when it comes to vaccines, and I know there's there's legal strictures there. But when it comes to COVID nineteen and the lies about COVID nineteen, the lies from government, the lies from NIH, the lies from Fauci, from Peter Daszak, from others, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you launch investigations into them? Why wouldn't you file lawsuits? And of course, we we have seen. Uh, I should you know, I'll check myself a little bit, that we have started to see these types of lawsuits done at the state level when it comes to attorney generals, attorneys general, like uh, like out of Missouri and I believe Louisiana have filed lawsuits against the CDC and against the NIH. But I'm talking personal lawsuits. I'm saying get personal with this. Why not? Why not sue Dr. Fauci? Why not sue Dr. Pishak, Dr. Dashak directly? Um, why not go after Peter Dashak? I don't know if he is a doctor. Um, why not go after EcoHealth Alliance? It's so obvious that there are groups that could be doing things like this. And I'm not just talking about, oh, you know, this this bragging. But, but if it's know, that obvious, why is it, why isn't it happening? Amendment. If it's that obvious, why because is it happening? What do you, what's your theory? I think that uh, my theory is that is that there's a lot of people out there who they're they need a software upgrade. You know, it's kind of like when your when your cell phone is operating on the old model, and you think that we're still living in the society. And I wish we still were living in the society where we had a republic and we would just present information into the public sphere. And we would say, "Oh, look, this was a lie. That was a lie. We can, you know, we can go from there." But unfortunately, we don't live in that world today. We live in a world where people take power, uh, where power is found, and then people go and listen to their, you know, echo chamber, and the other side listens to their echo chamber, and never the twain shall. Be. NPR just had a massive whistleblower over the week. Weekend, but nobody who actually listens to NPR knows that there was an NPR whistleblower. And so uh, we can see but that the, the, the former levers of power aren't there anymore. And so now people need to look to new levers of power. And this is why I say, you know, when I say things like that, reciprocity, eye for an eye, Lex Solanus, I'm saying, no, 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 I'm not talking about violence. I'm just talking about actually doing things to cause pain financially, time wasting, et cetera, et cetera, when it comes to this in order to stop them from uh, from the gobbling up of power that they're doing. Josh, I, I'm imagining that persuasion has a law, an important role to play, in, in, whichever, whichever side of this you're on. Um, and hypnosis at its, at its sort of more um, common, common application is persuasion, right? Uh, and how would you distinguish between like a legitimate grievance and the pathology you reference because there are legitimate grievances. I mean, people have been worrying about income inequality for a long time. They're, 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 they're cautioning me that I should call you Joshua and not Josh. Early on, somebody said I should call you Josh. So I apologize for that. But Joshua, uh, is, is there, is there something, I, I think that's a, an area of 
it's confusing for me. I mean, there are legitimate grievances that people have. And then there's using those grievances in a persuasive way to try to do these things you guys are alleging is happening. How do, how do you tell the difference? And how do we know that something more global is happening here? Yes, in previous regular communist revolutions, the socioeconomic grievances were obvious, were undeniable at a glance. There, there was initially no persuasion required for the have-nots, for the oppressed, to know that that was in fact the case. For example, it wasn't until 1861 that the Russian system of land-based slavery, that the serf system, was outlawed. And then even after that, there was an effective form of debt slavery that the freed slaves, the serfs, had. And then that persisted for generations, that great suffering, up until the turn of the century and beyond. So there, there was, in fact, a system, an ingrained system, and this is what the left will often talk about. They'll talk about systemic this and systematic that. What, what we have is actual systems of oppression that was in the place of law. Now, what happens in other, maybe irregular communist revolutions, is they will use that same sort of language of oppression, that sort of coaxing behavior that... it progressively convinces you to realize, or perhaps to believe, rather, that you are not the master of your own fate. You do not control your own future. It stows people. And of course, we see the racial and sex-based messaging of the that is the operational preparation of environment for cultural revolution here in the United States, particularly beginning with the 1960s. Now, Prior to that time, there had, in fact, been actual systematic oppression of certain classes, groups, obviously. But what, what had happened from that point and beyond, it went from equality under the law to equity, to social justice. Those people took from you, so now you should take back from them. It's only fair. And that is a shift, it's a subtle shift from equality under the law to the people who are to blame must be punished. We see that language beginning in the 1960s spread throughout college campuses, and it stayed there ever since. And as the people went and graduated and entered institutions, those institutions, be they education, be they media and entertainment, be they government, the people who graduated from that period of education that is now who is in charge, who has infiltrated the institutions of the United States of America. So that operational preparation of our environment for cultural revolution has unfortunately been successful. People with the oppressed versus oppressor model are in place and are in positions of power to implement the oppressor versus oppressed social justice model, where the descendants of people who were oppressors, or at least people who just look like them, must be punished for the sins of people decades, if not centuries ago, who look like you because that's only fair. And you being this individual, you may not have ever suffered a grievance at the hands of the alleged oppressor, but if you look like the people who did, well, then you qualify. You get to have the benefits of oppression. And that sort of term sounds a little odd and, and strange, and yet it's the real deal. Tell a population they can get something for nothing, and they will line up right out the door for that, no matter how jo noble the motivation may be. Joshua, we, before you wrote this book, were you interested in this material, this history yes. and th this phenomenon? Okay. Yes, a number of uh, years ago. Uh, go ahead. No, no, you. Yes, a number of years ago, I, with a friend, it was late one night, in fact, it was early morning, right around four in the morning, at a little Irish bar in uh, Battery Park in New York City. A friend and I were talking about what we was we were, had noticed following the 2016 election, how it was not okay for the right to organize, but it was very much okay for the far left to violently organize. And we thought, why is it okay to be far left and violent, but not okay to be right-wing and peaceful? What's going on here? 
And that ultimately turned into a documentary film, an award-winning documentary film called Better Left Unsaid. The director's Kurt J Jai Mungle. Fantastic film. I was executive producer on that. And the purpose of that film, released in 2021, was to share the reality of what happens during a communist uprising. How violent these things can actually be, particularly towards women and children, and how all of it is justified in the name of the oppressor-oppressed imbalance. And how the families of the alleged oppressors must suffer in order to create a sense of social justice for the alleged oppressed. And that that bloodshed, that seizure of property, it's only fair. And that was my first foray into this personally, because right around that time, I, my, my wife and I began having children, and you begin to care about these things more once you realize you have a, you have a literal biological stake in the future. And I wondered if one day I would return to this topic in a literary capacity, being a professional uh, writer and, and book author. And it seems, though, that the time has come to return to this topic. And then, Jack, uh, I, you, you again, calling upon your intelligence uh, history, well, actually, working in intelligence. If, could I, oh, could I throw ahead. in could I throw in something there? Because you, I, I, had a, I had a really interesting thought when you just mentioned about legitimate grievances and legitimate, specifically economic grievances. And I could talk about one right now very quickly. And going back to China, the relationship, the trade relationship with that we have with China is absolutely a disgrace when it comes to working class and middle class in America. There's no question whatsoever that that relationship is done at the behest of people who are at the tops of these, these massive multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. They're may, extracting so much out of this relationship. It was all, and we, we, we explained this in the book, um, how it was put together. It, 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 Look, the Chinese regime could have, the CCP could have been knocked over with a feather on June 4th, on June 5th, 1989, after Tiananmen Square. On June 5th, it could have been knocked over with a feather. But what did we do? We went over and cut this, this deal with them. And General Scowcroft goes over and cuts this deal from Bush Sr. and says, we're going to, you know, you guys are going to be the factory of the world now. And we're going to give you all this stuff, all these tchotchkes, and we're going to let you in the club. And this is when we saw the systemic and you want to talk actual systemic repression and systemic um, systemic uh, issues, what we've done is we've sold out the entire middle class, the manufacturing base of this country. Mm -hmm. We've sold out people at the working class and the, man and the manufacturers. And in doing so, enrich the Chinese Communist Party. It's all by design. It's 100% by design. But you talk about this, and you talk about writing that trade relationship. You talk about things like tariffs, doing anything to actually help the people of this country and have them see their, their real wages rise for the first time, which pre-COVID was something they were starting to see for the first time in a years. And yet we'll never have anyone talk about that because they would rather have you pay attention to some, some as Josh was saying, some racial grievance from hundreds of years ago or some other thing, some trumped up thing in the media that you don't want to raise everyone about. Meanwhile, we're all getting poorer, inflation's getting hotter, and China is running away laughing to the bank about it. So, Jack, uh, I give you. Let's wrap this conversation up by by sort of uh, summarizing and and each give you each a chance to say you know, where is this thing going, and what does the average person need to do about it. Uh, Jack, you first. Well, let's say Joshua first, then I'll come back to Jack. Go ahead, Joshua. Sure thing. We close unhumans with the call to action at various levels of society. So we say, if if you're potentially that great man of history of of our history, here is what you specifically may be called to do. And we lay out multiple suggestions with examples of that. And then for the every man, woman, and child, we say, here's what you can do to prepare your environment for the micro-revolution to come to you. Here's how you can defend yourself through reciprocal means uh, and otherwise. Now, the irregular communist revolution we're experiencing right now is different in that it's not a sort of hot war where there's people waving red flags, holding pitchforks and axes and other weapons in the streets, marching into government buildings and slaughtering everyone. It's it's a bit more on the down low than that, where these little revolutions and revolts are targeted at specific individuals, their families and businesses is what we've seen over the last few years. And so that being said, it will probably stay that way for a while, which means that there are 300 plus million potential communist micro-revolutions that could take place. Each normal, everyday, law-abiding citizen being a potential target 
of that little micro-communist revolution coming for them, canceling them, purging them from society and from their career, seizing their reputation, their finances, their income, sending them into bankruptcy and ruin, dissolving their marriage, their relationship with their family, horrifying, horrifying things, even driving them uh, to, to the worst case scenario in some cases. But what we can do is we can prepare ourselves for that event. And those who are men and women of means, there are things that you can do at a much more influential scale to right this wrong and to end this, or perhaps should we say crush the communist revolution currently taking place in the United States. I will uh, have to read that chapter. Jack, last thoughts, same, same question. Well, I agree. I think when a lot of people get this this book, they're going to turn to the last chapter first. And that's okay because it's not a whodunit. But this this the way that it plays out is it talks about that. And when Josh is right, we go into the great men of means level. Look, that's, that's your Elon Musk going and founding, uh, taking over, I should say, refounding X and allowing it to be free. People like uh, the folks, Joshua um, Pavlovsky and others at Rumble, putting that together, True Social, those guys making that actually give, being able to give us freedom of speech back to the internet and restoring it. But then it's also about going into your churches, going into your school boards, making sure that the things that are being done there are congruent with what you need. In some cases, people going and moving to homeschool, finding ways to build a parallel economy. It's it's all about people taking action. And that's the main key precursor to any change here. It's about people taking action to fight back. And if you find someone who is con who is being uh, who's going along with these things, who's in your community, who's on your school board, wherever they are in a place of power, if you have the leverage and ability to do something about it, like those moms did in Loudoun County, Virginia, a couple of years ago, then it is incumbent upon you. And in fact, it is your duty to do so. A duty to your children, to your family, a duty to yourself to actually go up and get rid of these people in places of power, get them out, send them home. Don't worry about it. Stop trying to worry about their feelings. Don't worry about if they call you and you, and you have to stop worrying. You have to stop worrying about if someone calls you, you know, they said, they call me a mean name on the internet. And they said this, they said that about me. And oh, this guy said something. I don't care. You know why? Because I care about my family more. I care about my town more. I care about my community more. I, and ultimately, I care about my country more. And if you put all of that ahead of the things that will happen in between, you will always win out on the side of good. This is a this is a book that is pro-humanity, and that's why we gave it the title Unhumans, because it's all about representing human flourishing, human progress. And the main thing, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll end with this, and it's something that my my friends on the right and I, I think we have a problem with sometimes that we don't define what we call a viable competing vision. The left is great at telling you what their vision is. It's ridiculous. It's a joke, but they're they're happy to tell you how it's going to work and everyone's going to get some video going around. Everyone's going to get free PlayStation 5s when socialism comes. Look, as, as silly as it sounds, they're at least presenting a vision. The vision that the right and the vision that sort of the normals uh, need to start envisioning and promoting in society today is a country where people can walk down the street in a place that's in a major city and not worry about looking over their shoulder. It's a city where we have trade with other countries, but we're not getting constantly uh, taken advantage of and that our, our ports are humming with commerce and that our bridges aren't falling apart in them and falling down, killing workers. It's a city where we have basic law and order, but we have good services that we're able to take advantage of on a regular basis. That's all we're talking about, where we have innovation. And yes, by the way, a, a society that takes care of people that legitimately do need help. It's a basic vision for society. It used to be called the American dream. It used to be called the American Republic. And if we're ever going to get back to it, we have to start actually describing what it is and what it looks like. There is the book. Thank you, gentlemen. Follow Josh, uh, Joshua on X at Joshua Lysek, L-I-S-E-C. Jack uh, on X, Jack Posobiec, P-O-S-O-B-I-E-C. And uh, also on X, Human Events, and look for the uh, Human Events Daily there. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Dr. Drew. I got to say, you know, before we started, I went around the studio here, made sure I changed all the smoke detector batteries <laughs> in my place to make sure that <laughs> I didn't fall about. into the trap, the love line trap, because I learned a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. Don't do it. Not just don't do it. Uh, you're opening yourself to real abuse. 
uh, if you haven't <laughs> changed the nine volt battery, because you, as Adam would say, only a lizard could live in an environment with that thing is chirping at you and not reach up uh, uh, yeah. immediately and just change the damn battery. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There you go. God bless, man. All right, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, uh, again, uh, coming up, we have Matthias Desmond tomorrow with Autumn Smith from Paleo Valley. I want them to come back and have a sense of humor on the next one because they're really funny. They're they're funny, but they're talking serious stuff about this book. Oh so my them, they're walking God. Back. Mike Benz uh, with Anthony Brown, who is uh, setting up a, a new homeless shelter in uh, in Ohio. Uh, Salty Cracker coming back. Naomi Wolf, Tom Renz, Donald Trump Jr., Mike Lindell. We've got a great lineup coming. I'm going to be in Florida in uh, the first week of May. We're going to have Peter McCullough and... Uh, in studio, we're going to do some from some stuff from Florida that first week of May. Uh, so, uh, I just want to say a couple of things about this. This what we were just talking about. There are a lot. There's a lot of unhappiness in this country, and it just seems to me um, back to the French. The uh, words of Voltaire: We've got to cultivate our own gardens. Take care of your own family. Flourish. Thrive. If we get more people, families that are healthy, children being raised in a healthy environment. Uh, we won't need any of these great, yeah. you know, huge reactions. To, I was to, thinking about how I felt about, like living in California. I've seen mm -hmm. things crushed, and during the Black Lives Matter riots, mm -hmm. I felt like we were the target. Like I, you know, I just posted something that said, "This is what it's like to live in LA." Because a friend of mine had sent me a video that was taken in the jewelry mart area and they were just crushing the windows and taking all the jewels. And these are family owned businesses that have been there for years and years. And when I posted it, this very woke crowd came out. Well, you know, you live in your, your high and mighty place in Pasadena. How would you know what it's like to live in LA? And I was like, and my daughter was like, take that down, take that down. I said, no, I'm not taking it down. This is how it is to live in LA. It's not right. Why is this, why are we defunding the police and letting people run amok? Well, why are we not why protecting we ourselves? Getting people to thrive. That That is, we, we need to find way. All Downtown the, LA is destroyed now. All the experiments thus far place. have been ineffective. And it's time to do things that work for people and, and get everyone back into health and mental health and spiritually healthy and thriving again. It's, it's it's not people are quite able to do that, but we have to we have to you know create the soil, create the environment for that. And it's it's that's the hard part. It's getting the ship kind of turned because we can help people. We can make them thrive. I was talking this morning about homeless. These are all people that could thrive. We just can't let them die on the street. We have to do something to or turn them. into the angry mob. I mean, they were a big part of it. It just, you know, that's that's what's going to take over California is that we're not helping people. Well, I, I, I am I am more interested in in people thriving, uh, and that that I think. Th and what bothers me is these these alternatives that are coming up have never worked. They always result in disaster. Be a student of history. It's why I think it's interesting these guys wrote this book. You can see the mistakes of the past and you end up with a strong man stepping in, some sort of Napoleon or Franco or something. And now what have we done? So let's um, get Unhuman back to Unhuman is available on pre-sale at Amazon. And um, I'm sure if you just- Ah, uh, pre-sale. Okay, got it. I do believe. I, I want to read that last chapter. Uh, all right, let me uh, quickly, if you guys don't mind, let me look quickly at the um, the Rumble Rant, see what you guys are thinking. Uh, sorry. Okay, I don't see anything I need to address right there. I'm looking at the restream Everybody as well. Everybody was very uh, sincere Yes, Rumble uh, today. Tom Cigars. Anthony will be in here to talk about his progress. Uh, that's on Wednesday, I believe. Uh, tomorrow's uh, Autumn Smith. Uh, hang a second. Uh, thanks for having Jack. Uh, mostly, mm -hmm. bye bye. People are saying. I just like you know. I see like how Bush you know moved everything to China, and then mm -hmm. Trump tried to stop it. You know, and then and then there was a big envious. I mean, we'd already lost so much business to China. Well, so what I'm going to talk tomorrow, Des Matthias Desmond, about is whether or not this is the, whether or not personality traits have cycles to them through time. And that certain personalities are prone to envy and prone to these phenomenologies that we have seen as mass formations. That's what we're going to get into tomorrow with Matthias Desmond. So be here for that. That is early, I believe, because he is in Europe. We are at noon yes. tomorrow. I might check me on this, everybody. 
Right. We are at noon tomorrow, so I want you all to be here for that. We've been trying to get him for eh, 14 months, <laughs> a year, and a year and a half, something like that, because I came upon his material early in the COVID hysteria. And uh, to have somebody who was studying hysteria long before COVID hit, uh, I found it very interesting. And I want to uh, discuss that with him. So we'll get into that tomorrow at noon. Uh, on Wednesday, we're back at 3 o'clock again, but I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at noon. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com/help.